Hello and welcome to Premier Injuries. Uh, before we get into the discussions tonight, remember to like, share and subscribe to the channel because we've got a lot of great content coming up. But today we have a very special data show indeed. You know what we've done, Ben, over this international break. We haven't taken time off from football. No, we've thrown ourselves more into data, more into analysis and more into making sense of this weird thing that we call the Premier League. So this is actually the first part of a mini series about the end of season data trends. And this will conclude actually in part three with a special show about how this all affects the Premier League and the FPL teams that we'll be all looking at from game week 30 onwards. But these two standalone spe specials that are coming up are going to be all about data, all about analysis. So it's probably a little bit different from the usual FPL content that you have. Now, in this first show, we're dispelling two big myths of the Premier League. The first of which is, do teams drop off after reaching the safe 40-point mark, if they do ever reach that total. And then the second one is the summer holiday effect. Bit of Donny Osmond there. The effect having a downturn in the output after the international break, going into the final eight games of the season, which we're hitting now. Sometimes people argue that teams kind of give up the ghost once they reach that little bit towards the end of the Premier League season. Uh, to give insight, we looked at four seasons worth of data, starting from... What we're calling, Ben, aren't we, the anomalous 2019-20 season, obviously with COVID and everything. So we went back four seasons to kind of equal that out back to 2016-17. And then we're also looking at specific groups as well. So we're going season-wide across all teams and kind of giving an overall analysis, but then going between the title hunters, which we're calling the teams fighting to win the Premier League late into the season, the European teams, those in and around getting European slots mid-table, which are teams unlikely to make it into a spot that would grant them European football. And then obviously those relegation battlers, those fighting to stay up and also those that don't have the fight to stay up. So all these groups have different needs, motivations and kind of styles. So just going into it though, Ben, first and foremost... Do teams drop off after reaching the, say, 40-point mark? What is your kind of initial thoughts on that? Because it is a bit of a myth in the FPL and, and Premier League community, isn't it? I mean, the whole premise of, of this um, week of research, which for people who maybe won't appreciate that Jason has slaves hour upon hour meticulously pulling the data on that. So, you know, first and foremost, uh, thank you for that, Jason. Um, I hope it's appreciated and I hope this it goes down well because like I say there's a lot of hard work and effort gone into this um, and yeah so going back to your you know your initial point and your question it's this stage of the season where inherently um, I almost default to you know you know fixture difficulty rating is, is always something which is high on on fantasy managers thinking when they're looking to strategize and plan transfers, you know, particularly what we call the business end of the campaign. This is an opportunity for you to maybe to gain some valuable points, steal a march in your mini league, increase overall rank, or similarly, you know, you do want to slip away if you're holding one of those, you know, top 1% places. And for those looking for maybe, as I always am, differential dinnery, you know, looking for those players who maybe just sneak beneath the radar, um, you know, I've always been drawn to what my perception is that teams who have maybe, to, 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 to coin a commonly used frame, as, you know, playing in their flip-flops. And by that, what we mean is, is players and teams who literally have nothing to play for and they just want the season to finish. They can't wait, you know, for that final whistle on the final day so they can, you know, uproot and off sticks under normal circumstances to Sonia claims. And for that reason, you know, it, it's about identifying, you know, possibly where those teams who you think are maybe going to kick back, where they're maybe matched up against teams who've still got something to play for. 
and therefore there's a little bit of value in terms of maybe their picks with those teams. So, you know, um, maybe the Fulhams and the Newcastles of this world and the Burnleys who still need those points to try and maintain top flight status, you know, are those assets worth buying? Are those assets, you know, of interest? And ultimately, you know, so does the data back up that, you know, common uh, maybe misconception that, you know, these anomalies uh, do occur during this season running. So hopefully those will be addressed and I'm sure, you know, you'll have a lot to tell us, Jason. Yeah, this is the thing that I wanted to to look at. Now, the flip-flop teams, what you're saying there of with teams who have nothing to play for. This is actually part two, which we will come on to in the next video. So that is another reason to stay subscribed. But yes, we wanted to look at the effect of where or if even at all teams come into this maybe psychological, maybe fatigue, maybe it's like a, a number of components here into that flip-flop status of we've played the season, we're kind of fine, we don't need to do it anymore. Where does that happen? So this first initial mark of the 40-point safe mark. Now, the inspiration for me on this one was actually Watford FC, the Hornets. Kind of, it became almost a joke in the Premier League each season it seemed once they got to that 40 point mark they had a drop off and they were kind of fine to to coast towards the end of the season each of their players probably thinking oh I'm looking forward to that summer holiday with the missus with the kids and and everything like that and it is proven with Watford FC so in 2015-16 they had eight points from their last 11 games finally getting to 37 points total sorry after getting to the 37 points total so again that 37 slash 40 point mark there averaging it out they were kind of happy to coast along then 2016-17 they lost their final six games after getting to 40 points 2017-18 five points from their final nine matches after getting to 36 points and in then 2018-19 10 points from their last 11 games and defeats in their final three matches in a row after getting to 40 points. It just seemed to be almost within the club, this mind frame of, right, we've got the job done. We don't need to play any more. Now, I do want to take a turn off this discussion point of 40 just for a second because itself actually does seem like a myth. From my research, we looked uh, to kind of this 40 mark, is it actually the safe point? And what I would say is I, I, I'm going to give credit where credit is due. I did look at the BBC for this and they did a fantastic investigation into this phenomena and they came to the conclusion that the worshipful 40 point mark, as so many teams look forward to, is actually outdated because that has only been the threshold for survival once over the last 16 years. It's actually lower than that. And so up on screen, we're going to put it up to you that actually the data of kind of the mark that you want to get to 36 point is where you're more than likely to stay up. And then in 2003, uh, 2002, 2003, maybe to, to give more context to this, West Ham set a record for the highest points for a relegated team. And in the history of the Premier League, there's only two teams that have actually finished in the bottom three gone down with 40 points or more. These were Sunderland, which I'm sure will put a wry smile on your face there in 96-97. Uh, then Bolton Wanderers in 97-98. So kind of looking at this, with West Ham, with their record of 42 points and still getting relegated, maybe we could say that 43 points should be considered the lowest point tally and the safety net. But we're going off the data here. We're kind of going off this mythical point there, and we're going to focus on 40 in our data. So just kind of before we get to our investigations, Ben, are you a little bit shocked by that, that 36 points is actually, in many cases, the data-wise, you're more than likely to stay up after that point? Because when I was looking at it, I was a little bit shocked. 
I mean, it does seem a tad bit low. Um, and, you know, this mythical 40 points, uh, I can understand, you know, because clubs are well versed in, you know, what's required to stay in that top flight. You know, they will map out their season. They will understand what needs to be done against who and when and with which personnel. And they probably know, you know, underneath it all that 36, 37 points will be good enough. But as you alluded to before, you know, psychologically, the players on the pitch, you know, you don't want to be telling your players, right, once you hit 36 points, you're safe. Because you have that, that, that pressure pot environment where you're hitting sort of 30 points and you need a couple of more wins and you know subconsciously our players well you know if we're just a point below that we still got a chance you aim for 40 you know if you shoot for the moon the 40 points and if you miss you're still amongst those stars Jason you've still got a chance of staying up on 37 38 or 39 so yeah I mean 36 does seem low um, and I wouldn't feel comfortable if you know, if the legs of Newcastle were sitting in and around that, I still, you know, just for my own peace of mind, I'm happy with 40, 41, you know, to, to lock in, hopefully, another season in the Premier League. Yeah, once it passes that 40% mark, it, it's that kind of thing of almost solidifying it, that it, it's that worry over. And, and I think... Again, looking at our investigation, so moving on to our own data here, I think a lot of teams buy into that because we found that 71% of teams, once they reach that 40-point mark, actually continue to perform at the same level or actually above even reaching that 40-point mark. So from with this one, we looked at three seasons, and in the title hunters category, it's ridiculous the kind of consistency from those teams. Liverpool in 2019-20 were really the only anomalous performance, whereas all the other teams, all the other first or second place position teams actually finished the season after hitting 40 points with a higher points per game during run-ins. Um, now, other things that we kind of looked at this, so overall it seemed to be not a strong correlation between 40 points and drop-off in performance. As we said there, only 29% 20, of teams kind of had problems with it. But we did have a look at all other kind of brackets of teams, and we will kind of break this down for what we think this means for Fantasy Premier League as well in the third part of this series. But only once in 2017-18 has the bottom side which was West Brom, took their points per game to above 1.0 and finished outside the bottom two. So it's very rare that they kind of have a bounce back effect. And for us, we were kind of saying that this basically kind of writes off Sheffield United, who have looked so dreadful this season, but also the current incarnation of West Brom, who will do well to exceed their current 0.62 points per game. Elsewhere in the table, as we've broken this down, there seems to be value and maybe the biggest potential for points per game, goals and all that good stuff that we want in terms of Fantasy Premier League. In positions 15 to 18, we saw an average increase of seven places or a higher overall points per game than the rest of the Premier League. So those teams that are fighting in those positions are potential for rises and then in terms of historical data, those with the greatest potential for a downturn, so maybe ones that might be to avoid, are teams uh, placed 7th to ninth, And these are teams that they have maybe the European position just out of grasp. Maybe they don't even think that they're worthy of it. So maybe a team like Burnley a few seasons ago, they were on the cusp of getting Europe, but they might have given up the ghost because they thought, well, our season objective was just to stay up maybe like Sheffield United last season as well they were looking good for Europe and then after project restart there's obviously all those other factors but maybe they just thought we're not good enough maybe imposter syndrome came in for those poor blades there but these team experienced a drop in points per game uh, so kind of eight places dropped so 
teams maybe like Liverpool might be having squeaky bum time there. So again, Ben, what do you kind of derive from this data here? Because it seems to us that there's not this huge link between game week 30 to 38 that we're going to expect to see a huge difference uh, in results because we, we've already passed that 40 point mark for a lot of teams. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that I picked up from this, and I think what we need to do is is add context. And I think you need to import your own opinions um, and experiences on, you know, on this data. For me, the likes of maybe Liverpool, Arsenal and Everton, I can see those three teams who are occupying those seventh and eighth and ninth at greatest rates of dropout. I can see those teams pushing on. So, you know, quite the opposite to, to maybe what the data has been telling us. Um, you know, I'm certainly expecting a big finish from Liverpool. I know a lot of the chat has been with regards to um, Trent's emission from the England squad. But from a Jurgen Klopp perspective, he'll be absolutely buzzing with that. You know, he gets, you know, a couple of weeks worth of rest in, he, in, he, in his legs. You've obviously got other players on, on, on far-flung corners of the earth, but the likes of Shakiri will be getting some valuable minutes and increasing his sharpness. Uh, I'm not sure if Kieta has went away, but he's another one who's on the fringes of that squad and who will benefit. So I think you know Liverpool are, are, are a team that um, I'd, I'd certainly expect to maybe book that trend. Um, Ancelotti, you know, he's hopeful and optimistic of a, of a European place. Um but yeah, you know, when I'm looking at, at differentials, it certainly makes sense. Those teams in and around that, you know, lower third, you know, that 15, 16, 17th place, the teams that have still got a chance to get sucked in to that dogfight, you know, it makes sense that, you know, for me, what, you, what you're buying into, if you're looking at some of those assets and some of those players, you are going to get teams who are playing for the full 90 minutes, you know, if bearing in mind, and I suppose there's a, there's a caveat to that, there's some that may question Newcastle's performances of late, Brighton, and whether Steve Bruce has lost the changing rooms. You know, we will assume from this perspective that, you know, it is purely just black and white. And, you know, if, if players are going out there, they still want to win games and they still want to play on behalf of their club and their coach as professionals. That isn't always the case. So that's the slight caveat there. But um, look, at it just what it does for me, it just opens your eyes to other possibilities, other differentials. And, you know, if you're looking to make move in these final sort of eight or, or nine games, then this is a great opportunity to do so. So we actually did then focus on the final eight game period, because as we mentioned at the start there, the summer holiday effect of teams having a downturn in output. This is something that, is really banded around the the Premier League community. People kind of often say, once they've had that taste of the international break, they've already seen the sunny shores. Some players have gone back home and kind of seen the sol in the sky, you know, put some sun cream on as they're avoiding getting sunburnt. But they want to go home or they want to go with their families and relax a little bit. And so game week 30 to 38, it is perceived that a lot of teams kind of take that downturn. And for some teams as well, as mentioned, Sheffield United, they might have this effect of, we've done well this season, pat ourselves on the back, that's it, job done. So initial thoughts there then as well, Ben. Is this something that you've seen a lot of people kind of buy into as, as a narrative that people play into uh, and maybe affect their decision-making as well? It, look, it's it's easy to buy in. It's easy to be swept away by the headlines. We're all just waiting for one result, you know, after the international break, the anomaly, the one where a team that, you know, have done all right, who are safe, suffer a shock defeat. Maybe it's a heavy defeat. And then all of a sudden, the headlines are there. You know, the players are, you know, kicking back, not that bothered. And, you know, you can take that on face value. You know, unless you scratch beneath the surface and really look at the numbers behind um, that, look, it's easy to get. So I've, I've been there, I've done it. I'll probably continue to do that. 
I mean, what I would say as well with, and I touched upon it before, just with, with Gareth Southgate and, and with England and, and maybe the admission of Trent, we've got players who are maybe who felt comfortable and confident of maybe being involved and included in that England squad. Now maybe they're just, you know, a little bit concerned that they're on that that fringes. You know, we, we all would expect maybe the Jack Grealishes of this world the Jess Lingard's, you know, thrown his hat into the ring. Um, Callum Phillips, he started the last two England games now. Jordan Henderson, he will be, you know, returning from injury. So maybe that easing back for players during this period, you know, there are going to be, you know, some key players in there as well that are going to be looking to push on and really put a line in the sand and give Gareth Southgate and other national team managers, um, you know, who are, who are playing within that Premier League, you know, they're going to give, want to give their managers something to think about before those squads are finalised. So let's then have a look if this worry, this narrative matches up with the data. And as always, we're putting this data on screen so that you can follow along. But I would also recommend that you head to the Premier Injuries website because we're putting this data on there for you to enjoy, to read through the articles. And there's a lot of other good stuff on there as well. So make sure to stay tuned to that as well. But overall, in the Premier League, there was a slight difference in performance over the four seasons. Now, this is over the whole Premier League. So we're going to break this down. But across the 20 teams, the points per game actually goes up from that game week 30 to 38 period. So we're just kind of looking at that period where people expect a bit of a downturn, but there's actually an upturn in terms of points per game. Teams actually score a little bit more, which is great fun in terms of enjoyment of watching games but they also conceded slightly more in those eight game week period. Now, there could be all manners of reasons, and we'll discuss that in just a moment, but we'll break it down by each group as well. Now, the first of all is the title hunters, the top two, and they push on a fair bit once they reach that game week 30 period. And I think it's that kind of inspiration that they're vying for the title, so they do have a lot to play for. They earn more points per game towards the end of the season than actually earlier on in the season, which is incredible. They score a lot more and conceded only slightly more than before. So they're really almost banging it up a gear, going up a notch so that they can finish that season on a high and possibly lifting that trophy. Now, a little bit of shock to me, and I think this is why I love looking at this data, is that the teams vying for European positions are the ones that actually have a significant drop off in some data their points per game goes down once they reach that game week 30 period as does their goal scoring but their goals conceded actually stays relatively stable now this talking point I think could be an incorporation of maybe a more conservative approach maybe the Mourinho mindset leaks into a few more managers than would like to admit it that they go on defensive fortitude to cement their places towards the end of the season so with those two there Ben title hunters and European positions the first group it's only two teams, but they're obviously the best two teams in the league that season. And then the European position teams, where there's actually a downturn in quality in terms of goals scored and points per game. Are you a little bit surprised by that? And also, from a data and psychological perspective, do you think that that is surprising or, or not surprising at all? Um, I was a little bit surprised at the consistency of the top two going into this final period, uh, you know, particularly when we've seen maybe, I know we've seen this Liverpool and, and, and City title race, of, they've pushed each other on and, until, you know, until the, the last game of the season on, on some occasions. Um, so, yeah, from, from that perspective, yes. Uh, but it, with regards to those and, and those sort of vying for a European spot and maybe it's the, it's the difference between maybe a Champions League place and a, uh, a Europa League qualification, then they're not so much. I think psychologically, you know, you, you, you've got this a different mindset 
you walk can almost look you've been playing with the freedom um, and the confidence all season to to hopefully get you into a, a position where you can at least be challenging for that European. Now, when that possibility becomes a reality and you start thinking too far ahead, um, you know, that's when maybe this, again, you, you, this more cautious approach, you forget about the basics, you forget about the style of play and football that got you in that position in the first place. This is, you know, and I and I use the um, the uh, the example of of managers now in the current top ten K because I, I you know I follow the community and, and there's a lot of chat about this about where do we go now? Do we go with stick with template and do we look to maintain that top ten K finish and think you know what is great? If you had said that, if I was top one percent, I'd be happy. Or do you throw caution to the wind um, and do you then push on to finish the highest place that you possibly can? You know, on the understanding that, you know, it could effectively blow up and your overall rank, you know, you could slip out that 10K. So I can understand um, why teams, why players, why, you know, fantasy managers have this dilemma and why maybe the data um isn't necessarily you know reflective of of what's happened before the season you know if we look at, at the premier league and and just in terms of the financial um you know implications of qualifying for european football or not is huge you know you, you could be talking about maybe going out and, and buying or attracting the likes of a 50 60 70 million pound player to all of a sudden, maybe are you scratching around and maybe looking at the likes of, you know, a Newcastle <laughs> player or, or Burnley, you know, with, with no disrespect. The, so the, the, the sums of money are huge and you have external pressures from outside of the team in terms of stakeholders, directors, managers, coaches, you know. So there's a lot of other factors that do come into play because, like I say, it's at that point where the dream is almost to become a reality. And that's, you know, just getting yourself over the finishing line is, is sometimes the hardest part of the job. And looking towards the rest of the Premier League table, this story kind of continues because mid-table teams, they remain relatively unaffected. Now, you can argue that some of those teams there, because we're going from uh, the 8th position down to 15th. Those in 15th might actually up their abilities just because they want to avoid relegation and then they settle. But they do have a slightly higher points per game from game week 30 onwards. So again, kind of reflecting that assumption that we have there. But those slightly up the table and those further down, they've all got different reasons for playing as they do but as long as they feel safe, I think this group of teams feel fine. And the teams actually do play a little bit more attacking with just 0.1 goals per game a bit more. So, again, this is hardly a big rise. This isn't like what we're talking about a little bit early with the title hunters or the European position teams where there's a much more. This is literally 0.1 goals per game more it's, it's about average and in slightly more steely defense as well but again this could be all for sorts of reasons now we get to the final bit and this is the largest drop-off witness but we're not surprised here are we these are relegation teams and it's why they're relegated they're not the best teams in the league and quite often obviously tomorrow's uh video that we're going to be discussing which is teams with nothing to play for that is the mathematical point where they've got nothing to play for they're they're relegated their spot is kind of confirmed or they can't really improve it a lot of these teams realistically are already relegated they've been relegated a long while ago they have no hope and so this is reflected in their data because quite often these teams they might have that math Mathematical ability to stay up but going into game week 30 these are players that might individually one or two of them want to put on a good performance but 
the whole team, they're just not up for the task. And so you see a big drop-off in points per game of these teams. But what is most pronounced to me is the defensive and offensive drop-off from these sides. The goals per game and goals conceded per game just go in a negative direction that you don't want to be seeing from these sides. You want to see more fight, but actually they give up the ghost. So again, we will talk through how this affects FPL teams, but it is quite an interesting one. So just coming towards the end of our analysis here, Ben, would you say that the myths so far, the assumptions, the stereotypes of the Premier League, have they been 50% debunked? Because I don't think they've been fully debunked. When you look at the kind of team-by-team team grouping, some of them do match our assumptions, some of them don't. Um, yeah, well, how much can we believe in these myths? So the first of all, just to remind people, was the do teams drop off after the 40-point mark? And the second one is the summer holiday effect from game week 30 onwards on teams. Are they real, Ben? I think what the data tells us and, and what we, or what it should tell us and what we need to take from this is you never, you know, nothing's on face value, first and foremost, because um, this is a, an ever-changing environment. It's not a level playing field anymore. Vast sums of money. You know, we've seen positions in Premier League now. Can, you can, you know, it can be seven-figure differences between a, a position or two in the league. Um, all of these different pressures, all of these different stimulus affect teams in different ways. So like me, coming into, you know, just seven days ago, I had these these preconceptions about how I would see these remaining game weeks pan out. And that's been stuck with me for a number of years now. And, you know, I would never really veer from that. There was no real need to because what I thought was right. What this tells me now is that maybe, I'm not going to say I'm wrong, but maybe I'm not as right as I thought I was. <laughs> So <laughs> you need you see, so you need to maybe be a little bit more um considerate um and you maybe need to to understand the playing field and, and look at the, the context around each individual player and or team managers and the bigger picture as well as opposed to maybe just looking at something in isolation and saying, right, well actually in previous seasons gone by. This is what happened. So this is what is going to continue to happen. It certainly isn't that case. And I think this point here, obviously, with your point of maybe not as right as you once were, uh, we might not be right this season with this data. But the reason why we wanted to do this as well was kind of obviously FPL content is week in, week out. But that only applies to game week 30 in the season 21, 22 or wh whatever it is. We wanted to make this content here to, to almost be there to analyse going forward. And we'll add to this each season as well. But this is kind of a benchmark so that from this point onwards, you can kind of look forward to pre-plan and make it a little bit easier for you with your, your teams or whatever you want to do. You might be into betting or, or however you want to use this data here. But yeah, th this was kind of a long-term idea with with this content here so that's the conclusions that we have so far and we hope that you find it helpful we hope that maybe you can be more like differential dinnery and pick out some absolute corkers towards the end of the season and just as we come to the end here as well i do really ask you to like share and comment below just so that we know that you like this style of content that this is the sort of thing that you're into as well because it helps us kind of create the content that you want that you need for your teams and of course give us a subscribe as well because we've got a lot more great data analysis coming up but for me it's a many thanks to you for watching and a good luck with whatever you're doing with this data and I'll just hand it off to Ben to sign us out yeah and thanks once again Jason um great first part Looking up, already looking forward to the second one and, and getting this all out there in open so we can plan ahead of so, those remaining gimmicks. So thanks for following, guys. Exactly what, what Jason said. Look forward to hearing your comments. Um, yeah, and I hope you took a lot.
from it. So thanks for watching and see you again very soon.